Raiders of the Giant Peach in Chapter 2. After James Henry Trotter had been living with his aunts for three whole years, there came a morning when something rather peculiar happened to him. And this thing, which as I say, was only rather peculiar, soon caused a second thing to happen, which was very peculiar. And then the very peculiar thing in its own turn caused a really fantastically peculiar thing to occur. It all started on a blazing hot day in the middle of summer. Aunt Sponge, Aunt Spiker and James were all out in the garden. James had been put to work as usual. This time he was chopping wood for the kitchen stove. Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were sitting comfortably in deck chairs nearby, sipping tall glasses of fizzy lemonade and watching him to see that he didn't stop work for one moment. Aunt Sponge was enormously fat and very short. She had small piggy eyes, a sunken mouth and one of those white flabby faces that looked exactly as if it had been boiled. She was like a great white, soggy, overboiled cabbage. Aunt Spiker, on the other hand, was lean and tall and bony, and she wore steel rimmed spectacles that fixed onto the end of her nose with a clip. She had a screeching voice with long, wet, narrow lips. Whenever she got angry or excited, little flecks of spit would come shooting out of her mouth as she talked. And there they sat, these two ghastly hags, sipping their drinks, every now and again screaming at James to chop faster and faster. They also looked about themselves, each one saying how beautiful she thought she was. Aunt Sponge had a long-handled mirror on her lap. She kept picking it up and gazing at her own hideous face. I look and smell, Aunt Sponge declared, as lovely as a rose. Just feast your eyes upon my face, observe my shapely nose. Behold my heavenly silky locks, and if I take off both my socks, you'll see my dainty toes. But don't forget, Aunt Spiker cried, how much your tummy shows. Aunt Sponge went red. Aunt Spiker said, My sweet, you cannot win. Behold my gorgeous curvy shape, my teeth, my charming grin. Oh, beauteous me, how I adore my radiant looks and please ignore the pimple on my chin. My dear, oh, trout, Aunt Sponge cried out, your only bones and skin, such loveliness as I possess, can only truly shine in Hollywood, Aunt Sponge declared. Oh, wouldn't that be fine? I'd capture all the nation's heart. They'd give me all the leading parts. The stars would all resign. I think you'd make, Aunt Spiker said, a lovely Frankenstein. Poor James was still slaving away at the chopping block. The heat was terrible. He was sweating all over. His arm was aching. The chopper was a large, blunt thing, far too heavy for a small boy to use. And as he worked, James began thinking about all the other children in the world and what they might be doing at this moment. Some would be riding their tricycles in the garden. Some would be walking in cool woods and picking bunches of wild flowers. And all the little friends whom we used to know would be down by the seaside, playing in the wet sand and splashing around in the water. Great tears began oozing out of James's eyes and rolling down his cheek. He stopped working and leaned against the chopping block, overwhelmed by his own unhappiness. What's the matter with you? Aunt Spiker screeched, glaring at him over the top of her steel spectacles. James began to cry. Stop that immediately! Get on with your work, you nasty little beast! Aunt Sponge ordered. Oh, Auntie Sponge! James cried out. And Auntie Spiker, couldn't we all please just for once go down to the seaside on the bus? It isn't very far and I feel so hot and awful and lonely. Why, you lazy good-for-nothing brute! Aunt Spiker shouted. Beat him! cried Aunt Sponge. I certainly will! Aunt Spiker snapped. She glared at James and James looked back at her with large frightened eyes. I shall beat you later on in the day when I don't feel so hot, she said. And now get out of my sight, you disgusting little worm, and give me some peace. James turned and ran. He ran off as fast as he could to the far end of the garden and hid himself behind that clump of dirty old laurel bushes that we mentioned earlier on. Then he covered his face with his hands and began to cry and cry. Chapter 3 it was at this point that the first thing of all, the rather peculiar thing that led to so many other much more peculiar things, happened to him. For suddenly, just behind him, James heard a rustling of leaves, and he turned round and saw an old man in a funny dark green suit emerging from the bushes. He was a very small old man, but he had a huge bald head and a face that was covered all over bristly black whiskers. He stopped when he was about three yards away. A 
and he stood there leaning on his stick and staring hard at James. When he spoke, his voice was very slow and creaky. Come closer to me, little boy, he said, beckoning to James with a finger. Come right up close to me and I'll show you something wonderful. James was too frightened to move. The old man hobbled a step or two nearer and then he put a hand into the pocket of his jacket and took out a small white paper bag. You see this? He whispered, waving the bag gently to and fro in front of James's face. You know what this is, my dear? You know what's inside this little bag? Then he came nearer still, leaning forward and pushing his face so close to James that James could feel his breath blowing on his cheeks. The breath smelled musty and stale and slightly mildewy, like air in an old cellar. Take a look, my dear, he said, opening the bag and tilting it towards James. Inside it, James could see a mass of tiny green things that looked like little stones or crystals, each one about the size of a grain of rice. They were extraordinarily beautiful and there was a strange brightness about them, a sort of luminous quality that made them glow and sparkle in the most wonderful way. Listen to them, the old man whispered. Listen to them move. James stared into the bag and sure enough there was a faint rustling sound coming up from inside it. Then he noticed that all the thousands of little green things were, were slowly, very, very slowly stirring about and moving over each other as though they were alive. There was more power and magic in those things than in all the rest of the world put together, the old man said softly. But, but, what are they? James murmured, finding his voice at last. Where do they come from? Aha, the old man whispered. He'd never guess that. He was crouching a little now, pushing his face still closer and closer to James until the tip of his long nose was actually touching the skin on James's forehead. Then suddenly, he jumped back and began waving his stick madly in the air. Crocodile tongues, he cried. One thousand long slimy crocodile tongues boiled up in the skull of a dead witch for twenty days and nights with the eyeballs of a lizard and the fingers of a young monkey, the gizzard of a pig, the beak of a green parrot, the juice of a porcupine, and three spoonfuls of sugar. Stew for another week, and then let the moon do the rest. All at once, he pushed the white paper bag into James's hand and said, Here, you take it. It's yours.